So over the last few months, as most of you know, I've been working on a big main project and I'm happy to say the first part of this is complete. So the f main part of this project revolves around two of these. Now this is a worm gear, it's a fairly simple contraption based around a single screw that turns a cog. The advantage of this is that whilst the screw can turn the cog, the cog cannot turn the screw. So once this is in place, it locks and will not move. Also the advantage is if you've got a high gear ratio, you can get a lot of force out of these. So I've got it wired up with a drill motor, and it turns like this. So now, without further ado, let's go through how you make one of these. Okay, for the first step you're going to need three things. A round block of wax, a tractor, and a pen that can make marks on the wax. The block was very easy to make, I just got a circular container. I think it was the plastic tin for some cookie cutters, but anything that's basically round and will hold wax will do, plastic, metal, that sort of thing. Anyway, it's not hard to make one of these, didn't think I needed to cover it. If you don't have anything round, you could just make a square block of wax from putting it in a square tin or any sh shape will do, as long as you can then cut a circle out from it. You might want to use a compass for that so that you get a proper circle, because that is important. So, once you've got your circular block of wax, what you then need to do is get your protractor and mark out where each of the gear's teeth are going to be. It is useful if you work out where the centre of it is. Just put a dot there for reference so that you can centre your protractor. Now I'm just going to put a line every 10 degrees because that's easy. Okay so once you've got everything around the end what you then want to do is get a point halfway between each of those and make a mark there and just go around the outside making a mark halfway between each of your points on this side. Once you've made your lines all around the outside you want to join your line here to the next one between the two with a diagonal line. Once you have your lines you want to cut a 3mm groove between each of these lines to form the area that the screw will sit in as it drives the gear. The raised areas you leave behind will become the teeth of the gear. It's not essential for this to be perfect but do put some care in at this stage to make sure that all of the grooves are parallel to each other and are all going in generally the same direction because it will make it a lot easier when you're trying to operate the gear later and there will be less problems when you're trying to get the gear to sit straight and remain in its place while it's operating. After a long time I've got all of my things cut out. Unfortunately through the cutting I did knock off one of the bits which was unfortunate but I do think this is a good opportunity to show you what to do if this does happen to you, because it's not impossible when you're sort of there with your knife trying to knock it out that you'll just cut through one of these as well by accident. And that's not a problem, all you've got to do is heat up a little bit of wax until it melts, and then as the wax is cooling there should be a stage where it's sort of capable of being pushed around by your finger. This bit's in the middle still more than, but see when it goes on your finger it'll just be a little bit. You do need slightly fireproof fingers to do this, you might want to do this with something that's not your fingers if you haven't developed immunity to fire yet. Though I do recommend developing fire immunity, it comes in incredibly useful, but anyway you can then make a small ball of wax in your hands, so feed it around. And get the gap, so put wax into there. And you can just do the same thing you did before, because be a bit careful because this bit will be more fragile because of how it was made. The side. Bit off the top. Bit off the other side. And there we go, so any problem you've got can be very easily fixed.
if it goes wrong at the cutting stage. So next thing you've got to do is find where your dead on centre is, I marked it with a thing, a dot I mean, then just draw some lines across the whole thing, sort of one like this. This is an optional step, this gear will work without doing this, but this helps um, save weight and possibly more importantly it saves metal when you're casting the thing to do this, so I think it's always useful. So divide it into six or eight or however many pieces you like. I think six is the best. Then once you've done that, just sort of in the corner, sort of draw in areas. Now these areas are going to be cut out of main gear, just to shed weight. One thing you do want to make sure of is that there's a large area around the middle and there's large bits going out to the gear from each part of these so that they don't disrupt anything that you might want to do. So now if you've got to do with those is go into the great cutting out cycle again and this again takes ages. Okay so it's been a couple of hours and I spent all that time carving the gear and I've got a whole bowl full of wax shavings that are cut off. So I've got that, I'm just going to alter the angle of that so it's circular so it doesn't annoy me for ages. So yes, I have a nice gear now, works fairly well. The other part I'm going to need to now make is the screw that drives it. And this is where it gets slightly more tricky, because for the screw, which I will respect, represent with this curvy line, to meet the gear, which I'll represent by these, you need to make it so that for every rotation of the screw, it moves the distance between one of the teeth. So say, if it's there, it needs to rotate and go to there. Or, of course, it can rotate and go to there, and you can have two of them. But that's choice. Now, I already know the angle, as I've measured it on my gear, is 15 degrees approximately. So, I have 15 degrees at the start, and I have my part of screw. So, I know that as the screw is going round, it needs to go, if I measure it, sort of here, that's about one centimetre, about one centimetre, mm, it's only about half a centimetre. Again, this is not perfect, so it's about three quarters of a centimetre here or 0.75 centimetres. So now we do the thing that will make everyone who's done high school and A-level maths cry and say we have to use trigonometry to find out what the diameter of our screw needs to be. So if we fairly simply do... let me think about this... Okay, so if we do the trigonometry the adjacent side, which is this one, which is the diameter we, well, the circumference we want, sorry, not the diameter, the diameter is something completely different. This is the circumference, of course, of the screw, because what it is effectively measuring, what it is effectively measuring is if you've got this one going round, going to a different place, that's a slightly longer line. If you then have it on screw, if you did a direct circle round, that would be the length of that side. So you find the adjacent or the circumference of the rod that this screw has to fit on is 0.75 over tan 15, which is equal to, if I put it into my calculator, 2.5. 
2.8 centimetres, effectively. Following on from this, if I turn this over, I need to know, of course, if I want to make anything, what the diameter of this will be. So if you have a circumference per circle, which is, of course, pi d, if to find the diameter, it is the circumference over pi, so 2.8 over pi equals 0 0.89 centimetres. So, effectively 0 0.9 centimetres, or 9 millimetres. So, I need a 9 millimetre thick rod, and then I can put on the screw onto the outside. The main method of doing that would be to make a rod of wax, and then by using the method I showed you to repair the thing, if you accidentally cut off one of the things, the way I made this bit, if you then put on the screw at the 15 degree angle going round there, that will usually work, and you will end up with something like this. So here I have my completed screw, it took a while, this is actually a second version of the screw. I built the original, but because this part is likely to break, I did make myself a silicon mould, so I can easily replicate it, but that was literally just, I stood the thing up in my vise, and I got a sealant gun, and just covered it. It's not the most efficient way of doing it, but it works, and it was easy. So that's why to make me screw. And if you look, the screw fits neatly onto the bottom of the gear. And then you sort of turn it around and move the gear. Again, don't try and make it a precise fit at this stage. You want to cast it into the metal when they're roughly fitting like this. You can always make final adjustments later with a file. Because, of course, remember the rule. You can always take some metal off if there's too much but you can't add metal on, or at least not without really, really sophisticated equipment if you've got not enough. So of course the next trick is to put it in plaster Paris or investment as they usually call it. So I gotta make a vague container to put this in. This is not advanced. I literally just build a cardboard thing around it and line it with tin foil. I have my two moulds, have my gear in here, have my screw in here. Just going to fill these up with plaster of Paris and leave them overnight to set. This one is directly in contact with the bottom of the mould I've made, so it'll be an open top cast and therefore doesn't need any air vents because of course it can just go at the top of the mould. Uh, this will need some air vents to let the air out otherwise you'll have bubble problems like I did when I tried to make my skull but I'm going to add them after I've added plaster of Paris by drilling a hole through and adding two straws to the side. Um, I'll explain more when I'm doing that part, but I found that this method does work and is actually a lot easier than doing it with more wax and then having to burn out the extra wax. Okay, so they've been here overnight. Now it's time to take off the crudely made cardboard mould and reveal what we've got on the inside, or at least what you can see of it, because of course quite a lot of the material will be inside mould. So I'm just going to take off all of the tape holding the thing together. Again, this is the most advanced and complicated mould design ever. It's taken years of R&D and lots of legitimate effort that is very scientific. Right, who am I kidding? It's it's just it's just a bowl of tin foil supported by some cardboard. It's literally not. It's the most basic setup you can have, but it works fairly well and it's quick and easy to do, so what else do you want? So, you have the bits of tinfoil here, 
but you could also probably, if I get a uh, knife, expose the centre fairly easy because this layer is not going to be thick at all over the middle. So this will be where you pour in the stuff. Take out the blue tack I had to stick it down to the bottom so that it didn't float. Okay, so here we have our two moulds, both been baked to remove all the wax. I just got some, for the air vents on this one, I just got some drinking straws, attached them to the side, covered the outside of them with plaster of Paris, it's a perfectly simple method, and the sticky tape is just in case these, because these aren't a solid piece with everything else, it's in case it cracks, it'll just hold it for the few vital seconds it takes the aluminium to cool. So these two already, I've already shown how the whole melting process works and it's not particularly difficult. So all that's left to do is pour in the aluminium and see okay, how it Okay, so we've got the mould ready on top of the forge here, I've just been preheating it so it's as hot as it can be. This allows the metal to be as molten for as long as possible and that allows it to get into all of the places. If you don't do this, it could be a problem. So I've got my crucible in under there, it's been heating up. It's full of a metal called duralumin. It's an alloy that they commonly use to create aircraft when they were first being developed. And it is, if I remember correctly, 90% aluminium, 5% magnesium, and 5% manganese. It has the ability of having the low melting point of aluminium, yet also being extremely um, uh, strong and more resilient than aluminium. It's much more uncommon that it would bend in any way. I'm just going to skim off any slag we've got here and working quickly because of course as soon as I've turned the fan off the metal is cooling down and I want it to be as hot as possible when I pour it in. So. Now, grab the mould, I mean the crucible, transfer it over to the mould. Good grief trying to say what you're doing whilst also doing it very carefully is difficult. So then we just pour it in and leave it in the mould. Make sure to keep the level high, keep pouring out stuff into the mould. That's all the metal we're going to get. So now whilst it cools, move it side to side. Shake it, just make sure that every part of the mould has some metal in it. And then just leave it to settle and step away. Now you just want to watch the top of the metal until it stops moving around, stops bubbling and stays completely stable. Of course all this fire and smoke is because I'm using plaster of Paris, it's not a perfect investment mix. But it is cheap and is, is something that you can afford and use fairly easily. So it looks like everything stopped moving now. Just got a little bit more, so I'll leave it for a bit, because of course it's better to leave it a little long and waste a bit of time than to move it too early and lose some of your detail. So I'll wait till the sporadic flames that are coming off the top here stop. Before moving it over to this bucket of water I've got here to cool it down and that'll give the alloy its strength. The quick, fast cooling from near its melting point to effectively room temperature, actually slightly lower because it's water, is what gives it its strength. There are some complex metallurgy reasons for this based around tempering, but I don't know the reasons. I've probably put a link in the description or down in the bottom corner of the video showing how all this works. So now we stick that in there. The water bubbles like crazy for a while. Whilst it takes all the heat away. We we'll just move it closer so that the camera can see it better. Okay, so I'm not going to immediately go in and get that, I'm going to wait for it to cool and we'll cut back and do a separate thing when I'm getting out of the mould. 
Okay, so second pour for the creation of screw. So it's been about half an hour since I took this out, I've given it a good time to cool, so now it's time to just get my hammer and start chipping away the outside of the mould. So we'll see what we've got in here. It's looking alright so far. We may have a good cast here. This is always the most nerve wracking part because you put all that effort in, and until now You've no idea whether you're going to get anything from it. Okay, so that's all the exterior bits off. Seem to have a nice bit around the side. It's a bit thin in places. Obviously, we didn't have quite as much metal as we needed. Which was strange because I used what I thought was the correct amount I needed. Probably should have put a bit more in to be safe, that's just me being stupid. But we have a complete circular cast. It's all come out. There's a few points here and there. But everything looks fairly well done. Yeah, I don't think that's too bad. So, now for the screw. See so yeah, how this one's gone. Of course, on the side here we've got the air vent. So this will be a long, thin piece. This was just where the air was able to escape down the side. feeling this is loose and I'm hoping that's not because the metal doesn't go all the way through. I'm just going to break it here. Oh no. It's been another air bubble problem. Let's see if we've got anything from this. So from the looks here, what's happened is it's gone down, it's got round, but then it's got into the parts here, and it's gone up, but then those are blocked, the air exits. So of course when the rest has tried to come in, it's cooled too quickly, it's not been able to get in, it's a shame. Oh well, we got the gear, and as I made the um, uh, wax copy, making another one of these isn't going to be too I've difficult. got the gear back from casting, I'm just going to use this wire wheel on the end of the drill to clean everything up a little. Just makes it look a bit nicer and move some of these outer layers. So if you look it's a lot more shiny on that point and it's got a little more definition. It's not 
required to do this, I just think it makes your pieces look a lot better. Okay, so the gear's been all nicely cleaned up and I can see fairly clearly now bits that I'll need to work down the file. In my next video I'm going to get a file, go around all of these, make sure that they're all trued up and ready. And I'll build the mounting and drill through so that I can mount it on an axle and drive it with a screw. Of course at some point I will need to cast a new screw but I already have a screw that I've cast whilst I was developing this and working on it over the summer. So it's not that much of a deal and I've shown the process behind making it. Anyway. So there'll probably be a link in the corner if the video's already out. If you're watching this as it comes out, you might have to wait a week or so. Hopefully it won't be longer than that. But I can't predict the future. I don't know what other things I'm going to have to be doing. And this is, as always, a hobby project. And I have to put some other things first. That's why this video's been so delayed over the last time. But... Things are all coming together, this project, hopefully when I say it this time it will be true, but it does seem to be almost finished, and we do seem to be getting close to finishing this. So until next time, this has been Infernal Contraptions, thanks for watching.